with a very brief discussion of why you might need to develop a homegrown electronic resource management system, or ERMS. Um, and we'll also talk about the ways that some of the database design tools and strategies I'll be talking to you about today can be applied to testing or trialing commercial or open source ERMS systems. Um, we're going to go through a variety of database design tools, including, as you can see, use case analysis, card sorting data analysis, and talk about tables and relationships in relational databases. I do have a number of slides of references and resources which will be made available to you after the session. And throughout, we'll be taking discussion breaks so that I can take your comments and questions. I do want to let you know that the presentation's a little on the meaty side. Um, so I recommend, as Esther said, there's going to be a recording made available. The slide deck will be made available to you as a PDF file. So kind of just let it wash over you like a warm summer breeze um, and really spend your energy thinking about how this applies to some of the systems projects or electronic resource management tasks that you're undertaking at your libraries. So to begin an obligatory disclaimer, I am not a software developer, information architect, or database engineer, but I am a librarian, so I like to think that I dabble in all of those areas. And as Esta said at the beginning, I was an electronic resources librarian, both at the paraprofessional and professional level for many years. So I had um, some uh, work to do in all of these areas. Again, why homegrown? As Esta described, when I assumed my first role here at Delaware County Community College, this is kind of what my desk environment looked like. I was inheriting information and tasks that had been distributed among a number of different staff people and was trying to organize them all under a newly created position. And also, as you can see, trying to digitize some of these um, paper files that we had, as well as reorganize some of the electronic versions of these files that we had into a coherent system that was accessible to all of my colleagues to facilitate the life cycle management of our electronic resources, to facilitate collection development and analysis of our electronic resources. Um, and really, the easiest way to do that was to have everything available electronically, but again, stored in some kind of sensible system environment. Oh, and what I should say is, we did not have um, the budget ability to implement a commercial system, and we did not have the staffing levels either in our library or in our IT department to support an open access system. So that's why I ended up developing something homegrown using Microsoft Access, and there are a number of other database solutions that you might look into if you find yourself in the situation of being unable to support either a commercial or open access system. So before we get too deeply into the database and information architecture design tools, I just wanted to go over some very key differences between traditional flat file databases and relational databases, which was really what we're talking about today. The classic example that we'll all be familiar with of a flat file database is the traditional ILS system, where um, all of the data is basically stored in one huge table. So if you imagine multiple books by the same author, um, you're sort of repeating, repeatedly storing that author's name in every bib record for every book by that author in your collection. So what you end up with here is redundant data storage, which takes up a lot of server space, obviously, as well as quality control issues. Um, hopefully, subject headings take care of some of those issues, um, but even transcribing a call number from a bib record into an item record can create issues. Um, and the other problem is that despite our um, attempts to standardize our, our data, there is some limited interoperability when you're dealing with flat file databases. Anybody who's done any kind of batch record uh, loading or deleting or trying to output records from an ILS and maybe get them indexed into a discovery service may know what I'm talking about there. On the other side of the column, uh, and what we'll be talking about designing today are relational databases. Again, a classic e-resource related example is most commercial ERM systems, um, where they're storing data in categorical tables, individual separate tables that all can talk to each other. Um, because you have these categorical tables, which we're gonna look at in more detail throughout the presentation, you only need to store each piece of data once. Um, so you don't have that redundant data storage issue. Uh, you're not, um, taking up too much server space by storing the same piece of information over and over again. And then you have better quality control because if you need to 
to edit a datum or update a datum, you only need to do it in one place. And then all of the other tables that share that piece of information are going to inherit the update. Also, because of the way uh, that relational databases are structured, their information architecture, you have increased flexibility in data use, both within the database itself and among other relational databases. So any initial questions or comments before we jump into deeper into our agenda? This would also be a good time to let me know if I'm going too fast or too slow. I'll just pause here for a second. Looks like we're in good shape, so we're going to soldier on. So why bother with database design tools at all? Um, I would argue that there are sort of three principles of good system design uh, that these design tools will help ensure that you accomplish. One is to minimize user effort. If it's too hard to use your system or if you're finding it too difficult to use a commercial or open source system, then chances are your uh, fellow users, your colleagues, are going to find workarounds. So good system design ensures that you're minimizing user effort, which increases the likelihood of system adoption. You're also going to minimize user error. So again, thinking back to the differences between flat file databases and relational databases, if you store a piece of information in one place and only have one place to think about updating it, that's going to minimize user error compared to thinking about storing that same piece of information in a variety of records where you have to remember all of the places within your flat file database that you would have to correct or update that information. So good system design, again, ensures that you're minimizing the possibility or potential for user error. And finally, because you're minimizing effort, you're minimizing errors, you're going to be maximizing user output, which gives you happy users, uh, the kind of users who might put their feet up on their desk at work because they're so content to use your well-designed system. Again, these are sort of my philosophies based on that master's coursework that ESTA described as well as some work experience, but recall my disclaimers, I'm not necessarily a professional in that field. So let's take a slightly deeper look at the specific design tools we're going to be using today. They all answer different questions with respect to either system design or your ability to sort of kick the tires of a commercial or open source system. We're going to start off looking at use case analysis, which addresses the question, what do users need to accomplish with the system? What are users' goals when they're actually interacting with the system? And obviously, that informs uh, what your system has to do, which informs its architecture and design. We'll then look at card sorting. So this uh, technique addresses the question of how users expect data to be stored or structured within your system. If you think about a menu or a website's navigation menu, uh, card sorting helps you answer where your users will expect to look for certain features. They probably expect your phone number and address to be in an about section or in a contact us page, um, and those are the kinds of uh, information about your users that card sorting would uncover. We'll also look at data analysis. So what exactly is the data that the system needs to store? And we can think about how that applies to e-resource management, whether it's the subscription life cycle, whether it's vendor information, payment processing information, all of the titles that come with an e-resource package. Those are all the kinds of things that you want to be considering when you're going through data analysis to design or maybe evaluate a commercial or open source system. Again, we'll take a more specific look at tables and relationships with respect to data storage and information architecture in relational databases. And then I'll give you sort of a brief preview of how I used forms in Microsoft Access to make the ERM system that I designed slightly more user-friendly for my colleagues. So use case analysis, and you can maybe see a slight example of this on your screen now, is really just a step-by-step -step narrative describing users' interactions with the system. Again, the purpose is to ask, what are our users' goals for interacting or using our system? It's very important to note that this uh, use case analysis process is always from the user's perspective. So if you can read the examples on the use case analysis form in front of you, you'll see that the normal course of action starts with requesting a lawn chemical from the chemical supply warehouse. So that's the user's goal when they interact with this specific component of the system. Um, that's plain text, you know, 
normal language. It doesn't take any kind of specialized degree or work experience to understand what's going on there, and that's the idea. So each individual use case is based on a single user goal. So again, in this example, we're talking about requesting lawn chemicals, and in a couple slides, I'm going to ask you for examples of use cases directly related to electronic resource management. And this is also an event-driven model. So it's showing how the user and the system will interact based on sort of, a, sort of a cause and effect relationship. So the user does this event, you know, they put in this request, the system is going to ask them for specific information, the user is going to provide that information, and the system is going to act on it back and forth until at the very end the user has accomplished their goal. What's nice about use case analysis is this is going to reveal most, if not all, of your functional or business requirements. In other words, what does the system need to do based on how we want to use it? So again, even if you're not designing your own homegrown system, this is a really nice exercise to go through with your staff, whoever is going to be using an electronic resource management system at your institution, to help you come up with some requirements that you might put in a request for information, an RFI, or a request for proposals, an RFP, to help you evaluate commercial or open source um, programs that are on the market. It's also helpful in identifying where there's special cases or what might trigger an error and how that should be handled both by the system and by the user. And if you are doing local development, this will help you prioritize features and functions. So if a majority of your users are saying that their goal is to be able to um, renew a resource seamlessly and maybe have your ERM interface directly with a vendor system to automate renewals, then you'll know that that's something that you need to prioritize in your system development and that that has implications for the data storage of your system that you need to develop early and some of the functions that your system will need to handle early on. Um, other features like maybe ingesting uh, usage statistics via the SUSHI protocol, you might be able to put off to a later date because not as many of your users are identifying that as an essential immediate feature that they want to use. And again, when you're thinking about testing, whether it's your own homegrown system or a commercial or open source system, these use case analyses give you real scenarios for kicking the tires and seeing, can the system handle our users' actual goals, the ways that they're actually going to use the system? In order to identify what those use cases are, again, each individual use case correlates to a single user goal, you want to ask, who are the users of the system that might be professional public services librarians who are doing collection development? It might also be paraprofessional library staff who are handling invoicing. So you want to think about the full scope of your users. What are their goals in terms of using the system? Whether it's something related to subscription renewal, collecting usage statistics, analyzing usage statistics, what are all the ways that you can anticipate or that your users are telling you that they want to be able to use the system? And then when do those events happen? Is it an internal trigger? So again, with, in the case of a subscription, you might want the system to alert you when something's coming up for renewal within 60 days. Or is there an external trigger? So if someone is trialing an electronic resource and they maybe give it a negative review <laughs> within your ERM system, does that then trigger um, a cancellation or some kind of flag on that e-resource in the system to prevent it from being automatically licensed, for instance. And then finally, how do those goals get accomplished? So what do your users need to do, and then what does, how does the system need to respond in order to accomplish those goals? What you're doing through this process is, again, identifying your main user tasks, so those main scenarios in which case the system is going to be useful, and what the triggers for those tasks are. So now that you've identified those top-level user goals, your top-level use cases, you'll need to start thinking about the individual steps within each case. To do that, you're, again, asking a series of questions. How does the work get done? Um, how does the system get the input that it needs from your users? And how does the user get the output that Z needs? Um, and I'm experimenting with gender-neutral pronouns, so that's not a typo, that's intentional. <laughs> um, just a little FYI. And again, what you're doing by answering these questions is identifying the preconditions for all of your user tasks, all of those system events, what the user will do to either input information into the system or trigger an event, and how the system needs to respond. 
once you've written your use cases and have listed all those steps, uh, as in the example that you see before you, now you're going to want to validate it and make sure that it's accurate and comprehensive and that you've identified um, any potential, again, exceptions to the use case or error generating scenarios. So those are the kinds of questions that you're going to ask. And ultimately, by following these steps, is your user able to meet their goal? Some techniques for accomplishing the validation of use cases include role playing, presenting the use case to focus groups, doing interviews with all those different staff users that you can imagine interacting with your ERM system, and just hosting workshops. So um, get everybody lined up in a row who participates in a particular workflow with respect to e-resources management and kind of have them a little role play um, their particular task and uh, work through the scenario of the use case and see if the system is really supporting their ultimate goal and all the tasks that they need to accomplish on their way to achieving that goal. So as I said, I'm going to turn it over to our attendees at this point and ask, um, what are some examples of use cases in electronic resources management? What are some goals that librarians and library staff have when they're trying to manage the full life cycle of electronic resources? And you can just submit those via chat to everybody. Exactly, Karen. So managing those due dates, probably getting some kind of alert when things are coming up for renewal, and also managing usage statistics. Exactly. Renewals always, um, I remember things slipping through the cracks and how upset that would make our users, our, our patron users, exactly. So managing and staying on top of renewals is a very popular user task um, that you could imagine that you'd want to prioritize with respect to either designing a system or testing a potential commercial or open source system. Um, and Karen also mentioned managing usage statistics, updating information when the platform changes. So Susan, I'm curious whether you mean updating information um, that's patron facing, so maybe updating URLs or updating metadata coverage information, or do you mean on the back end when the platform changes, so librarian facing information, or maybe both. But exactly, you need some kind of trigger to remind your library staff and librarians, URLs in the catalog and many other places, yes. So some way to keep track of all those many places, because we're working with often flat file systems, <laughs> that um, we need to update those individual pieces of information as things evolve, as publishers or vendors buy and sell their electronic resources back and forth, et cetera. Excellent. So in the interest of time, I'll pop up some of the ones that I came up with as I was thinking through this process. Many of them are the same as what you identified. So initiating a new subscription, um, reporting or tracking access problems. One of the things um, that I've been very interested in as an e-resource librarian is what's the response time among vendors and does that help us make collection development decisions if we can get comparable content from different vendors? Generating reports based on use statistics like Karen said, including things like cost per use, renewing was something that many people identified and again, collecting and recording those usage statistics. All examples of user goals and ways that a user would expect to be able to use an ERMS. So unless there are any other questions or comments with respect to use case analysis, we'll move on and talk about card sorting. I'll just pause for a second. Okay, all quiet on the Western Front, so let's soldier on. Card sorting is another user-centered technique for designing information architecture, and very similar to use case analysis, it does not require any system-specific knowledge or experience. Um, something that librarians will like, it's inexpensive, it's highly inclusive, and it can be quick to do. And what it does is help you discover entities and their attributes, which unfortunately we're going to define a little later on in the session today. But really all that that refers to are things you need to record information about and the information that you need to record about them. Those are entities and attributes. 
So as you can see here, you can do an offline version of card sorting where each index card represents a piece of information that you would want to store in your system. So in some of the examples that came up when we were talking about use cases, due dates is a perfect one, renewal dates is a perfect one, usage statistics is a perfect one, um, the URLs for access to e-resources is a perfect one. Those are all individual pieces of information that you need your system to store. And what you do is write those pieces of information on these cards, and then you ask your potential system users to organize those cards into categories. So again, each card, every discrete piece of information is a potential attribute that you're going to want to store in your system. And each of those categories that your users create is a potential entity or the potential thing that those attributes talk about or speak about or provide information about. This can also be done online. I know I'm speaking to mostly e-resource librarians, so, um, and it can be done online for free um, with a limited number of participants. So depending on your needs, that might work for you. Um, you can also pay to upgrade that service if you need to. We'll see that in a minute. So how do you actually prepare a card sort? Obviously, you need to think about what are all those pieces of information that we want to store in our system. You need to think about who is going to be using our eventual ERMS, and those are going to be the people that you want to participate in your card sort. And then you need to actually prepare the cards or input that information into the online sorting environment. So in terms of selecting the pieces of information represented on each card, you do want to be consistent with your level of granularity. And where you can find that information is to do some document analysis. So think back to that early slide where I asked why homegrown, and it was because I had information in Excel files, information in Word documents, information that had been printed out, information in PDFs of license files, information in paper files, et cetera. Going through all those pieces of documentation is referred to as document analysis, a fancy terminology from system design. Um, and really what you're doing is combing through and seeing what kinds of information do we collect and use about our e-resources. And you already identified a number of those. Um, and similarly, if you've already done use case analysis, you'll know the pieces of information that the system requires that either the users are going to input or that the system might already have, like a system clock, a system calendar, et cetera. Um, to identify, again, additional pieces of information that you want to include in your card sort. In terms of selecting participants, again, you can run the card sort with individuals or in a group, and really your question there is, who will use your system? Similar to the question you asked in terms of identifying use case um, analyses, who will actually use your system, and how do we get them to be as involved as possible in its design to ensure that they are adopting it, to ensure that it's meeting their, helping them meet their goals to ensure that it's easy to use. Remember that slide with the guy with his feet up on the desk. That's the sort of photo representation of the happy user. If you're preparing a, a hard copy card sort, then you're going to label each card with that discrete piece of information. So you might say something like renewal date. And if necessary, on the flip side of the card, you can provide a brief description, but the idea is to be as self-explanatory and transparent as possible. And since you're working in your professional community of colleagues, you're probably all using the same language and terminology to describe the pieces of information that you manage about your e-resources. And just a rule of thumb from the literature, anywhere from 30 to 100 items works very well in terms of validating the card sort. Fewer than 30, um, it's just really not very meaningful results and maybe a waste of people's time. Um, more than 100, uh, you may not identify consistent patterns of categorization, and it may just be so overwhelming to your participants that, again, they don't want to participate. So shoot for somewhere in that range. How do you execute or actually run a card sort? You want to randomize your cards because you do not want to influence your users to categorize them in any specific way. The idea is for that categorization or that information architecture to emerge from the ways that your users really think about these pieces of information. You're going to introduce the purpose of the activity. So say we're using this to see whether the design of a commercial or open source system is going to make sense for us or to suggest an information architecture and design for a homegrown system. And you want to provide those basic instructions of we're getting, giving you the raw pieces of data. You tell us how you would expect them to be categorized and uh, placed together within the system. 
You want to answer some basic procedural questions from your participants, but you want to, again, avoid leading them, uh, let them draw their own conclusions as to how things should be sorted. And then you just need a mechanism for recording the results. So whether you collect all the cards and keep them in the stacks that your users provided them in, or in an online environment, there are some reports that you can run to get the results of your sort. In terms of analysis, um, specifically in hard copy, you're basically looking for broad trends. So did the majority of your participants kind of group and categorize certain pieces of information together consistently? If you're doing it online or if you want to um, transcribe your results into a, some kind of online analysis environment, then you can use cluster analysis software to do that same work for you. So again, that's just looking at um, what percentage of the time certain pieces of information were clustered together in specific categories. In terms of an online card sort, um, at the time that I used this, the platform was called websort.net. It's since changed names to optimalworkshop.com, <laughs> um, but I believe that the interface is pretty much the same, and I did double check. They still allow you to do a free study for up to 10 participants with a maximum of 30 cards. So again, that hits that sort of um, low end threshold for usefulness. And if 10 participants covers uh, the full spectrum of your user group, then that might work for you. Um, as I mentioned, you can also pay to upgrade um, this particular sort service so that you can use unlimited number of participants and unlimited number of cards. So I'm not particularly shilling for this company. It's just the one that I have experienced um, and that I have some familiarity with. Again, in terms of your analysis, um, as of when it was websort.net, I'm not sure now that it's optimalworkshop.com, um, you could run some analysis to look at categories and how often items were placed into them, and then you could export that to Excel. So in the instance that you're seeing on your screen, I was the only participant, so it was sort of a way to summarize for myself where I thought each of those pieces of information should go, how I thought they should be organized in the ERM system. Obviously, if you have more users and they have the ability to create their own categories, what you're going to have to do is you can still run an analysis on the computer, but then you might have to do some higher level analysis as a human <laughs> to look and see um, sort of what categories are similar amongst your user groups. They may just have been named something slightly different. Um, and you're looking for, again, those broad trends and then other cloudy areas of discrepancy where maybe you uh, need to have a conversation together as a group to decide how do we want to manage these specific pieces of information that we didn't reach some kind of consensus on in terms of where we're going to put them in our system or how we expect a commercial or open source system to structure them and store them. Any questions or comments on card sorting or use case analysis, anything we've covered to this point? Or we'll get deeper into data analysis. And I'll just pause here for a second. All right, moving on. So can you provide the URL for the company change? Yes. Let me quickly pull that up. One second here. Optimal workshop. Sorry, I'm just uh, Googling them so I can stick that in the chat for you. Sorry, one second. I believe it's just optimalworkshop.com. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so you should have that link now. Thanks for that question. So we're moving past our um, use case analysis and card sorting. We've um, identified some pieces of data that we need to store in our system. We've identified the ways that our users expect to be able to manipulate that data within our system. Now let's get a little bit deeper into our information architecture and what our system needs to look like on the back end. The way to do that, the process is called data analysis. And with relational databases, you're typically using an Entity Relationship Diagram, or ERD, which again, you see an example on the screen in front of you. 
So what an ERD entity relationship diagram accomplishes is to visually display the types of information you need to store in your system and how they're organized and related to each other. And one thing I'm going to continue to emphasize throughout the session is we're still looking at the system from the user's perspective. So um, they'll need a little bit of orientation to what they're seeing in an ERD, but once they get the hang of it, again, this is all basic business logic. This is all um, sort of the um, names of the types of information that you already identified that you need to interact with and store in your ERM system. So uh, once they have an orientation to an ERD, your users will know exactly um, what it's um, displaying. So an ERD has some components that we've already touched on a little bit, but now we'll define them better. The first component, the big boxes, represent entities. These are people, places, events, or things. Again, rule of thumb is to use nouns. Um, and in a few slides, I'll ask you to think of some entities related to electronic resource management. Obviously, what you're seeing here is some kind of iTunes-like scenario where, or Amazon-like scenario where we're talking about people being able to buy music um, on, through an online service. Underneath the umbrella of each entity, you're storing some kind of information. And as we said earlier, that's called attributes. So again, that's information about your entities. You would not want a system that has an entity without any attributes, and like, uh, likewise, you don't want to have any orphaned attributes. So this ensures that as you've done some use case analysis and document analysis of all of your paper files or um, maybe Excel spreadsheets and Word documents about your e-resources, you're identifying all of these pieces of information and potentially also the entities that those pieces of information talk about. And that's what we're talking about in the ERD. The last thing is, because we're talking about relational database design, you need to specify the relationships between your entities, right, between your tables. And those relationships are described using verbs. So in the case that you see in front of you, a sale, um, or I'm sorry, a customer makes a sale. A sale is made by a customer. And we'll talk about the fact that in that relationship, the customer is the uh, parent entity, so the customer entity has to exist first before it can make a sale, which is the child entity. Um, and that has some implications for the inheritance of specific pieces of information, so sharing of information within the system. Again, um, ERDs, entity relationship diagrams, are all about showing high-level business rules or logic. So this is another nice way to ensure if you know what data your system needs to store, store, what functions your users need to be able to accomplish with the system, you'll be able to identify some of the business logic or workflows that your system needs to support, and that's a good way to either design a homegrown system or evaluate and assess or trial a commercial or open source system. Each of those relationships that we said was described by a verb will also show the directionality. So again, parent to child and the cardinality. So how many of each entity is required to participate in each relationship? And the modality. So is one entity required in order for an instance of the other entity to exist, as in the case of a customer and a sale? Um, a sale cannot exist unless there is a customer to make it. So how do you go about identifying entities to populate your entity relationship diagram? So again, one technique is to perform document analysis, go back through your spreadsheets, go back through your, your procedural documentation, go back to your use case analyses, and look for those key nouns um, that describe the workflows in which you engage to manage your electronic resources. Same thing, look for key nouns appearing in your use case analyses. Once you've identified those entities, now you need to know, well, what information does the system need to store about them? Those are your attributes. So again, you're performing more document analysis, um, asking slightly different questions. So what information do we already know about these entities, about these things, whether they're vendors, e-resources, packages, et cetera? And is there any piece of information that uniquely identifies each instance of an entity? So again, it might be a vendor's EIN or tax identification number, an e-resource subscription might have a subscription ID, um, and that will come into play later on when we talk more about relational databases and the relationships between tables. 
same thing. What are the user inputs and system outputs? Um, when you're looking at use case analysis, that suggests information that users and the system are sharing back and forth. And what are those uh, inputs and outputs about? Those would be your entities. So in terms of identifying and modeling the relationships between entities, you again want to ask a series of questions. So how are those entities associated with each other in real life? Again, the whole point is to reflect actual business logic, actual workflows with respect to e-resource management. In the case, the example that we see in front of us, we're talking about customers making sales, customers being targeted by promotions, um, customers creating maybe a, a favorite track list, et cetera. So those um, processes are all things that happen in the real world. They're not system specific. Um, again, in terms of thinking about your directionality and the relationships that your tables need to have in your database, you need to think about which entity acts on the other. So a customer creates a sale and not the other way around. We're also asking how many instances of each entity can participate in the relationship. That's the cardinality. So can a customer make more than one sale? I'm sure if you were selling things that you would hope so. Um, but can the same sale be made by more than one customer? No, that would be impossible according to the lo you know, business logic of creating sales. So that suggests to you the number of um, instances or um, versions of each entity that can actually be associated with each other in your tables and in your database. And we also addressed modality a little bit ago, but can any instance of an entity in a shared relationship exist without a corresponding instance of the other entity? So in the example of customer and sale, um, an instance of the customer, so the customer Sarah Hartman Caverly must exist before a sale can be made by Sarah Hartman Caverly. So before I can buy any music um, in the example on the screen. And that's the modality, so requiring that one instance of an entity um, be, exist in your system, be created in your system, before you can associate a renewal date with that e-resource or an e-resource with a particular vendor. You might want to make sure that the vendor exists and the subscription is recorded in your system before you get into those finer details. So I've already maybe given some away, but can you think of examples of specific entities in e-resources management? So again, these are people, places, things that you need to store information about in an ERM system. And I'll pause, you can send those through to all participants in the chat. Exactly, Karen. So we certainly need information about our vendors, um, and same thing with license types. I wonder if you'd be more descriptive for us with that, but one thing I'd imagine would be the difference between something that's subscribed and needs to be renewed versus something that's owned in perpetuity. Um, I know one of the things we were very interested in doing here, which I didn't quite accomplish before I changed roles, was um, having a flag in our local ERM system for whether a license allowed content from the subscription to be shared via interlibrary loan. Okay, thanks for that clarification, exactly. Site license, single user license, or branch licenses. I'll pause and see if anybody else wants to throw any ideas out there, and then I'll reveal some of the other ones that I came up with. Sarah, we had one suggestion come in through the Q&A, and that's pricing. Absolutely. Thanks, Esther, for throwing that out. Yes. Um, particularly if your ERM system is going to manage trials or going to manage um, the comparison of um, similar content from multiple providers, you would definitely want pricing information in there. Obviously, subscription costs are going to need to be there if one of your goals from use case analysis is to calculate cost per use. Um, same thing to monitor cost increases year over year if you've got a trigger like Anything that increases more than 5% needs to go through a particular review process before it's automatically renewed, for instance. Um, and Susan is giving us some additional examples. Your subscriber agent, information about them, absolutely. The publisher, the platform provider, maybe their URL, their admin interface, um, exactly. All are excellent examples of things that you need to collect and store information about in your ERM system. 
Um, so some of the ones that I have here are things that you already mentioned. Um, in fact, I don't think there's anything new in there that we didn't already talk about. So moving right along. So unless there are any other questions or comments about anything we've covered so far, data analysis, card sorting, or use case analysis, we're going to take a closer look at tables and relationships in relational databases, so kind of um, putting it all together at this point. I'll just pause in case there are questions or comments. Okay. So, what is the point of all this? <laughs> so, as we mentioned at the very outset when we were comparing flat file database architecture and structure to relational database architecture and structure, one of the things that you want to do is store each piece of information only once. Um, again, because that's going to help you manage the size of your ERM system and the amount of server space that it takes up, the amount of time it takes to update the system, the amount of time it takes to um, batch um, output or batch, batch input information into the system, and also because it minimizes user error by allowing you to update or correct a particular piece of information only once in the system and then have the corrected version shared everywhere else that it needs to be. Um, as opposed to with a flat file system where, um, God forbid, there was a typo in an author's name or something in a, in a field in a mark record, and you're not sure what other records may have the same typo or maybe missing the same diacritic, and you have to kind of pull all those records together and try to do some kind of batch update or go in one by one and see which ones are impacted. Um, if you're only storing that piece of information once, you only need to correct it once. And it's because of those relationships that we saw in our entity relationship diagram that tables within your database are allowed to share any information that they have in common. So if you're storing it once in table A, um, maybe a table about a vendor, but you also need that information in table B, maybe the table that stores all of your um, access URLs, they can actually share that piece of information because they'll have a relationship in your system. So we're looking at a raw table from the Access database that I created here at DCCC. And what I want to point out to you is, based on your use case analysis, your data analysis, and your entity relationship diagrams, all of those entities you identified that you need to store information about become tables in the database. So that's the articulation. All those entities, those nouns that you want to store things about, that you want to know things about, are individual tables in your relational database. As you may have guessed, all the attributes that you identified when you were doing your data analysis and your entity relationship diagram become fields in those tables or rows in you know, the Excel spreadsheet that you might be um, adding into your ERM system, loading into your ERM system. So entities become fields, I'm sorry, entities become tables, attributes become fields in those tables. And then the way that you instantiate a relationship is to first have some unique identifier for every instance of an entity. So these can be um, meaningful in some way in terms of your business logic. I gave the example of a vendor having a tax ID or that EIN number, um, but it can also be something that's system generated, which is kind of the example you see here. I think they're a little bit cut off, but for each instance of um, the entity, um, what am I looking at here? I believe this is the vendor information, it looks like. Um, they're just numbered, you know, 1 through 20, whatever. That was just a system-generated value. So because you have what's called those primary keys, those unique identifiers for each instance, when you need to sh uh, share information from one table to another, the primary key of that parent entity, so again, think about the directionality of that entity relationship diagram, the unique identifier of the parent entity becomes what's called a foreign key of the child entity. And by sharing that precise piece of unique information, you've now instantiated the relationship between the tables in your database, and they can share any other piece of information that you need them to. The database knows that they're related and knows that they're going to need to swap pieces of information back and forth. 
And I just want to pause at this screen and ask, does anybody, this is actually um, a back-end view in access of all of my entity tables and their attributes, but I'm wondering if anybody um, recognizes this image. It looks a little bit different, but pretty similar to a slide we saw a little bit ago. So which of our system uh, design strategies or tools does this look like? I'll just pause to see, maybe we've got some people thinking back a couple slides. But what we have here is tables that are entities. We have their attributes listed out under the entity name, and then we have the relationships among each of these tables or each of these entities. So basically what we're looking at is an entity relationship diagram on the back end of Microsoft Access. Again, you can see that the primary keys or the unique identifiers of all of our parent entities have become foreign keys in the child entities. That shared field is what creates that relationship. Um, but again, I want to emphasize you only need to store that unique parent key once. So for every instance of my vendor information, for instance, you know, I'll just use Credo Reference as an example. Let's say I use their tax ID number as their primary key, their unique identifier. If I want to then associate all of the e-resources that we subscribe to through Credo Reference, I'll be using that unique tax ID number as a foreign key or as a secondary identifier whenever I add um, an e-resource subscription into my e-resources table um, to make sure that the database understands that those e-resources are being subscribed through Credo Reference. But I only have to store that tax ID number in one place. And then because I've created these relationships among the tables, they can share that piece of information as well as any other information about those particular electronic resources and things that might be in the vendor table. So if I have a problem with the Credo Online Reference Platform, I can quickly pull up in my ERM system who I need to contact at the vendor to resolve that access problem. So again, I'll turn it over to our participants. Can you think of examples of entity relationships in e-resources management? So um, again, we've identi already identified some entities that we need to store information about. What kind of relationships do they have with each other? And can you think about which is the parent entity that needs to sort of pre-exist the child entity? And is there some kind of identifier that could serve as that primary key in the parent instance, which becomes the foreign key in the child instance? Exactly, Susan. So if you are going to keep customer service information in a separate table from your vendor information, then you need um, to instantiate that relationship. Exactly. I imagine that your vendor is going to be your parent entity and the customer service contact table is going to be your child entity. Okay, thanks. Exactly. Um, and a shortened version of the vendor name, as long as it's unique from all those other vendor name abbreviations, would be a perfect identifier. Thanks. So that's a great example. And again, these are all going to reflect your own local workflows and business logic, so they might be slightly different. Um, and this can be a useful ex um, exercise to go through, again, not just for developing a local system, but for evaluating the usefulness of a commercial or open source system. So some other examples that I came up with was um, a vendor having a relationship with a subscription. The vendor would be the parent entity, the subscription would be the child entity. Um, and I went a little bit further, so in terms of cardinality, you would probably only want one vendor to supply a subscription. You wouldn't want to subscribe to the same thing from multiple vendors, I would imagine. <laughs> and also, um, the vendor entity would be required before you could create a subscription entity. Um, but to go back to that cardinality, how many of each how many instances of each entity can participate, you could certainly have multiple subscriptions from the same vendor. So that's where you see that N. Um, that just means, you know, uh, unlimited, basically. And I'm suggesting that 
the vendor ID be something like the EIN, the tax ID number, or something just system generated. Um, likewise, you might have packages as an entity in your system and want to associate those with the individual e-resources that are part of those packages. Um, but not every e-resource is going to be part of a package. So as you can see in the little diagram there on the slide, package has uh, zero modality, so it's not required. Um, whereas e-resources, uh, instances of e-resources would be required before you could add them into a package. Um, same thing, chances are you don't want to subscribe to the same e-resource through multiple packages, although when we get into e-journal packages, that's obviously a possibility. Um, but in terms of system logic, um, you might want something in place to trigger an alert that that's what's going on. And same thing, often vendors, um, when you get subscription forms, uh, license forms, will have some kind of unique package ID that can be vendor specified, or again, you can always fall back on the system generated option. So it's not so important that those unique identifiers, those parent keys and foreign keys, um, thanks for the reminder. Yes, yeah, so I'm getting a time limit reminder. <laughs> um, Exactly. It, it's not necessarily information uh, important that those specific pieces of information make sense to your users. They're really working on the back end of the system to create those relationships in the tables, among the tables. So um, at this point, since we're coming up close to time, I will just let you throw any questions you have into the chat, and I'm going to push forward a little bit to make sure that we um, that you get to see um, how forms in Microsoft Access can make accessing this information a little bit easier. So again, in the before version, which we've been looking at, you can just see sort of the raw table of information and all the instances of the entities in that table. If you add forms through Microsoft Access, you get a much cleaner view. And because of the relationships between your tables, you can pull information from multiple tables into a single screen. So when, in terms of um, using Microsoft Access, if that's the route you decide to take, you need to establish all your tables and their relationships first. And after you do that, then you can go through the form building wizard to build those individual screen views. Um, and again, I'm not really qualified to answer specific questions about Access, but as of when I was working on this, there's sort of two ways to do it. There's a table or query option in the navigation pane. And you can also use that form creating wizard in the create toolbar ribbon. There's a variety of formats and features in those forms. And just a little word of advice, uh, lesson learned the hard way. <laughs> you want to have multiple backup copies of any homegrown system that you develop. One is a true backup copy that you're not going to touch except to overwrite it when you want to run a new backup. And one is a sandbox for you to play in and experiment in um, before you commit any kind of changes to your production instance. Also, you want to become friends with your IT department, maybe make some brownies or bring in some coffee or something, because they're going to be your friends in a pinch um, if there's something that you're not sure how to do uh, with your homegrown system or if, uh, because maybe you didn't have adequate backup practices, maybe you need to recover some aspect of your homegrown system. Hi, Sarah. We had a question. Um, sure. Have you ever evaluated Murphy Library's University of Wisconsin-La Crosse ERM, Electronic Resource Management Software? It is based in Access. Excellent question. Short answer. Unfortunately, I have not. I have not. I believe um, someone mentioned that when we were doing this presentation at the 2013 Mason Conference. Um, and unfortunately, by that point, I was already transitioning to um, my new position. So I never got a chance to go back and look at it. But I certainly encourage folks, um, my point in presenting all this information is not to have anyone reinvent the wheel, right? So as I've been emphasizing, we can use all these techniques to evaluate commercial or open source systems. Um, but if you find yourself in the position that they're not going to suit your needs or you don't have adequate budget or technical support to support those systems, um, then you might use these techniques to develop something locally. Um, but if someone's already created something that's um, us usable with Microsoft Access and that's the route you want to take, uh, by all means, you can use these techniques to evaluate that system. I just haven't personally done so. 
Um, and on that note, I believe we've reached our conclusion. The next few slides are just to reassure you that as a good librarian, I included citations for um, all of my um, information that I gathered to put together in the presentation. And these are going to be available to you. I did provide um, our organizers with a PDF version of the slide deck. Um, so I double checked all these links. They're all live. And I think all of them are freely available on the web with the exception of maybe one or two of the ebooks that I looked at. But obviously, if you have the same ebook collection, um, you'll have access to the titles. So that about wraps us up. Thank you so much for your attention and participation. Um, there's my contact information if you'd like to get in touch with me after the fact. Um, and I'll just hang out for a few minutes in case anybody has any last minute questions. It was my pleasure, Karen. Thank you for coming and participating. Well, I think if we don't have any other questions, um, and that's all the time we have for today. Uh, Sarah, thank you so much for sharing um, your presentation with us today. Um, and I just wanted to remind everyone that everyone who registered will receive a copy recording of the webinar. So, And uh, we had a request to send a copy of the chat transcripts because some of them were sent privately, and, and we will try to do that as well. So thank you, everyone, uh, for joining us today, and we'll see you at the next webinar.